Could everyone hear the first part? No. I thought I was so loud. Well, I asked the question, what's so important about hope? And I answered my own question by saying, because without hope, we can't go forward into the future. We have no heart to act. And I have a friend, Marty Seligman, who just recently wrote a book called Homo Prospectus. And his contention is that human beings are, should not be called homo sapiens because we are not wise. But we should be called homo prospectus because we're the one animal that thinks about the future. The story we tell about the future creates the present, creates possibilities for action in the present. So to have hope is really a key point in creating a new reality. Without hope, we can't create a new reality. We can't have hope those of us especially who were scientifically trained, without some realism in there. So we have a very distinguished panel that, I, that are going to be both hopeful and realistic. What we all have in common is that we're working together on a book called Realistic Hope with a lot of other authors, um, offering realistic hope, offering some, you could call them cases, of how that operates in conflict, in the big problems of the day, terrorism, um, the loss of jobs, rising inequality, climate change, all these big issues of the day. We don't have time to discuss all these today. And we're not going to be discussing the content so much as approaches. So I've asked each of our panelists to approach this in one way. Our first panelist, Claudia Youth, is actually going to talk about a couple of tools that offer realistic hope. Claudia was the former managing director of strategic research for the Rockefeller Foundation, and she has recently joined uh, the Cloudera Foundation as its executive director. After Claudia talks about tools, she'll pose a question, and I hope that the audience and the panel will join in discussing a little bit just then. We'll discuss that. And then we'll go on to um, Alenka, uh, Alinka Smirkola is the Minister for Development of Strategic Projects and Cohesion for Slovenia. And she's been involved in a project to create and implement a shared vision for the future of Slovenia. This is really amazing because, in other words, she's trying to turn realistic hope into action on the ground in a political context, which is very, very difficult. So she'll give us some perspectives on that project. And then again, we'll turn it over to the audience and the panel to discuss briefly. And then we'll move on to Angela Wilkinson, who was Director of Strategic Foresight at the OECD until quite recently, when um, she joined the World Energy Council to work with them on scenarios. And Angela's going to offer us some principles of realistic hope. So we'll have tools, perspectives, principles. And after each one, I won't be asking questions. This isn't like a, a serial set of interviews. We'll be discussing. So I hope all of you will join in. Following that, we are, we are very honored to have as our distinguished keynote commentator, and oh, there he is. <laughs> Could you stand up so everyone can see you? The State Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka, the Honorable Vasantha Sina Yaki. So thank you very much. And then more discussion and ending just a teeny bit early. So any questions about the format? If not, Claudia, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Just a few years ago, organizations that worked on poverty alleviation, such as the Rockefeller Foundation, wondered whether they would soon lose the purpose of their existence because the number of people living in extreme poverty was dropping. In 1990, half of the world's population was living under $2 a day. In 2015, that number had dropped to 14%. The future was looking good for poverty alleviation. There were many reasons for that. Economic growth in China and India lifted millions out of poverty. There was political will. Com countries rallied around the Millennium Development Goals. 
And some countries, such as the UK, committed 0.7% of their GDP to aid. So that was all good. But today there is a new reality in town. There, are, uh, there is slow economic growth. There is xenophobia and the rise of populist governments. <coughs> Official development aid has decreased significantly. Globalization is perceived as a threat. And the challenge of lifting those that remained in poverty is also not to be underestimated because those that remained in the last couple of rounds are often harder to reach um, and to, to assist. So if you don't care already, why should you care? Um, the, one of the panelists on the Water and Security and Peace panel said correctly, Poverty alleviation is one of the key factors to address security issues. It's closely related to business risks, particularly in fragile regions. And it clearly also has an impact on migration flow. So this is something that we should all care about, not only for moral reasons. And there is hope. Um, and there are tools, as Betty Sue was, uh, was talking about, that give me hope that we can achieve the sustainable development goals that have an even more ambitious goal of eradicating poverty in all of its forms by 2030. Innovative finance is such a tool. And just to be clear, the two tools that I'm going to mention, innovative finance and big data, will not address poverty on its own. So they need many other factors to really be effective. But innovative finance, please raise your hand if you know what innovative finance is in the development space. Not a lot of people, that's good, because I have a uh, definition prepared. <laughs> innovative finance is a, a, a way to raise additional funds for development by using non-traditional mechanisms. So those are financial market instruments, such as social impact bonds, so payment for success, for example, or what we call micro levies, micro taxes, very small taxes, for example, on financial transactions or flight tickets or revenues of extractive industry companies um, to raise additional funds for development. In the last three years, $2 billion were raised uh, for development through these different mechanisms. One example is an outbreak insurance. So it's an insurance product for African countries, and it provides African countries with the resources they would need in the case of a, the deadly spread uh, or the spread of a deadly disease at the first sign of an outbreak. So it's a smart way to raise money for an uncertain event. The second solution area uh, that gives me hope is the area of big data. I don't know if you saw the Economist cover recently titled that data is the new oil. So it means data is our most current, uh, most precious commodity uh, today. And nonprofit organizations have also started to use data, mobile data, for example, in new ways to help people get access to credit, as one example. Uh, because, as you know, or as you may not know, uh, a lot of people can't access credit because their creditworthiness can't be ascertained. So mobile data and data that we didn't use in that way before uh, now allows us to assess the creditworthiness uh, of informal traders in an African market. Or to use data to establish the economic identity of refugees in refugee camps and their skills in a blockchain format. In short, poverty doesn't have to exist. There are tools, some of them still in their infancy, but that have great potential to help us solve uh, the problems. What they need is, in addition, political will, uh, an enabling environment, and in many cases, the collaboration of the private sector to really fully succeed. So my question to you, among the questions that we are going to discuss, where do you see the biggest opportunity to create a future without poverty? Thank you. A big, a big task. <laughs> yes, a big task. Anyone with responses to that? I think you're going to be the one to come up with the ideas, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I have a, a question I want to ask you when you talk about um, 
this innovative finance. Um, have you heard uh, about the blockchain for, uh, for making payments directly to poor people in a way that um, traces them using blockchain, which is the backbone of Bitcoin and other digital currencies, to track the payment directly to poor people um, without the money being siphoned off by corrupt governments? Yeah, I mean, I think in the identity space, um, so to quit, yeah, you would I think it's on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, a lot of people don't have a unique identity, and that's a big challenge, and that creates a lot of graft along the way, so that money, as you say, doesn't securely reach people, whether they are in refugee camps or whether they are in, in rural areas of, of India, for example. Um, and there are a number of different schemes, not all based on the blockchain technology, but there is also, uh, Ilmas help me, ADAP? No, uh, ADAP. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, uh, very famous where more than a billion people have received a unique identif identification and can now receive money, for example, more securely. But in the refugee camps, blockchain technology also helps not only to establish, for example, credit, uh, but also to find, uh, be a safe storage place for health records uh, and, uh, and other <coughs> kind of um, documentation that might help to identify a refugee or to give these people, kind of allow these people to have transportable um, data along the way. And verifiable. Yes, Not exactly. Only transportable, but verifiable. In yes. a very secure way. Yes. Could you stand up so everybody can hear you? Thank you. Or actually, I could give you a microphone. Even better. Thank you, Manny. Great, okay. My name is Pierre Vanops, I'm from Switzerland. And uh, the answer about the, for the future, maybe talking about financial system, and you're talking about innovative finance. We, we prefer, I, I'm Vice Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, and we, what we like and we are working on is the, actually is the issue of sustainable finance. The future will be what, at the end, will be a change in the financial structure. It's, it's, we are, these are all products, tentative, things that we are developing, which are fine, all of them are very fine, but at the end, the key will be that certain key rules of the financial system will have to change. Rules that have been set up 100 years ago um, were not considering climate change, were not considering the fact that instead of one billion, we are eight or nine billion of people. So certain aspects of uh, sustainability, including social, including ecological, and, I'm not, and this will have to be part of the main uh, financial system. In a certain way, this relates to getting back, relink financial value to economic values, because the two have, completely, have been completely separated starting from the 20s. This is the key for us, and then of course we use we use what we can use. I mean, we are doing our activities in developing, uh, uh, in developing areas, if you want, but, but it's concerning all of us. I'm Swiss, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, and uh, actually, when we talk about the green bonds or the, or the sustainable finance, there are many, many, many banks now in Switzerland, most of them small, but they simply don't want to do the business that it has been done in the past. But still, the tipping, point for the big change of the system is not yet there. But when it will be there, there will definitely be, I think, there will be another opportunity with technology, with tracking, so accountability systems, exchange of uh, fiscal information, automatic fiscal information, not only among countries between, uh, I don't know, uh, in the European Union, but uh, G20 and then later on in other countries. These kind of things will bring, I hope, to completely wipe out poverty in the future. Thank you. Yes, I think there's a lot of realistic hope there. And I also find the realistic hope um, in the people involved in this. Um, I was in a, at a conversation with Max Levchin, who is one of the co-inventors of PayPal. I don't know, how many of you know PayPal? I see nodding of heads, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, I was at a meeting where someone challenged him, why don't you do for the banking system and the poor people who can't get what, and you mentioned it, um, 
for the for poor people who don't have any credit rating, why don't you figure that out the way you figured out how to pay? And he did. And so that's what he's doing with a new company um, trying to, and the way they do it is they data mine, big data, they data mine uh, Facebook and other social activities and say, okay, he's a stable person with a this and a that. And I mean, there's some shadow sides to this, of course, but, but it's offering a lot of people access to credit where they never had it before. And then you crowdsource the credit. You, uh, my son um, gives money and gets money back for uh, going into projects that would not normally be given credit to because the people don't have any, they're too young to have a, a credit record. So they're just, there's a lot of realistic hope out here with this tool of data that you've introduced, a, a, really a lot. Yes, there's a, could we have the, no. Ravi Chaudhary from India. Uh, could you stand up so everyone can see you? Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad that you have started this dialogue by highlighting the need if we can depovertize the world. That I think, now, but still, the dialogue that we have been having has the underlying thread that hope for the well-to-do, crowdsourcing, blockchain, Aadhaar. This, the, all these are how to sustain poverty among those who are poor. The question raised is how make how, how to depovertize. Now, what does it mean? I think I, I'm going to raise uh, three quick bullet points on that. First. Our entire structuring of governance is based, capitalism is good, but what has happened is that democracy has been hijacked by crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. So we have a distorted version of a trickle-down economy. The gravy is too thick, it doesn't trickle down at all. <laughs> and the, the trickle amount is very, very small. That's one. All the laws are ensured to keep the, make the rich richer. Now, second point is, there is a fundamental flaw in our concept of uh, fundamental rights and equality. I made this comment yesterday evening. Equality and fundamental rights are contradictory. The fundamental rights are used more by the well-to-do to trample the poor. Now, if we want to bring about equality, then the rich will have to have less rights than the poor. I think this is a fundamental change we need to intellectually. That alone will bring about hope. Otherwise, we will keep talking about hope, but hope will not result. And the third factor is that the decisions are to be made by those in power, and they are all driven by common dangers and not common good of the humanity. It's a four billion challenge, I call it, which has to be addressed. And that can only be addressed if the people in power start believing that life is more about being more rather than having more. That's why we are called human beings, not human havings. Thank you. <laughs> there was another comment over here, I thought. Yes. Partly, ah, sorry, Mariana Dermil. Partly, you raised the same issue as I wanted to, but uh, on the shadow side of this approach, that uh, you know can help pop, pop to alleviate poverty. I think that we should think about it now, yes. not to be too late when the abuse can happen, and there is quite high probability that that could happen. And I think that's what we have to have in mind while we are. Uh, designing the new solutions. Absolutely. Every, every step forward has a shadow to it. And um, we have to be aware of that. That's why we're not simply idealists or ideologues. That's why we are realistic. There is a shadow side, absolutely. Did you have something, Angela? I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I can't, I, no, I have no, to I, scoot I, um, back. I, was, I just like the, the clarification that we're not human, um, we're human beings. Not, that, human not, having. Human ha not human havings, and actually, I'd clarify it more than that. We're not just human beings. We're human doings and human becomings. 
And that's the, what we're trying to sort out. You know, it's not just the having that's the problem. It's the fact that we've actually lost the being and the becoming part of the narrative in Realistic Hope. Okay, yes, I think... Maybe to, to add to, to Ravi's point, um, one thing that really feels uh, also important to me, taking the example of, of finance, but looking at, the, at poor households, uh, when you think about the um, kind of more recent instruments of unconditional cash transfers, uh, or the studies that have been done around the portfolio of the poor, I mean, how do poor households save and, and take out credit? I mean, I think one interesting learning, I think sometimes there is the perception that we need to save the poor people. And, um, and I think the, kind of the, the research really has shown if you, if you give people what we call unconditional transfer, that means you give them cash and you don't, have, you don't tell them what to buy with that, that they, more often than not, the vast majority makes very smart choices. Uh, and for example, buys asset that allows them then to step out of poverty. So I feel um, the success of these instruments have really shown that we need to you know, trust each other and, and really collaborate and use new tools such as innovative finance or data or others really together um, and, and not from a kind of us and them or whatever, however we want to characterize a potential mm -hmm. relationship. You use the word trust, and um, this reminds me of, uh, of Alenka's project, um, <laughs> I, which I, I have some knowledge of. Um, I, I think it's extraordinary that, that you have worked on a future vision for an entire country and uh, it, it has at its center the need for trust. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and introduce that? And I, th the hardest, uh, I think the hardest stage on which to operate is the political stage, uh, not the entrepreneurial, not the business, not even the artistic, although you definitely have to be a human being, not a human having if you're an artist. Um, but I, I think, if, could you talk about this project and how you've managed? I haven't managed yet. <laughs> that's the first. That's the first statement. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, uh, it is my firm belief that uh, as a society, if you want to navigate all these stormy waters of uncertainties that are in front of us and are already with us, you, as a society, as a nation, you need uh, a vision. And, well, a vision cannot be designed in an office, even if that's the best office of the world. Um, you find out that, unfortunately, you have to go out, engage with people, and try and shape the vision around what the people really want. And it looked pretty easy to me at the beginning but in reality, it turned out to be a very difficult exercise uh, because it took us, well, because engagement, first of all, means a lot of time, a lot of time. And it took us a year and a half to really come, to really engage, to do the interactive workshops, to do uh, the events, discussions, um, different different discussions, different stakeholders, uh, and then try at the end or in between and along the way shape the vision of the society. Um, and we finally managed to come there. Uh, we released the vision in February. Um, and of course, you know, it, it's, it's not about the vision itself, it's about the process. Uh, because I think that we really went out, reached people at the beginning that didn't even believe what we were doing. So that was the first big obstacle. And then slowly but surely, we tried to somehow shape what really was coming out. And you, were, uh, you are right. For Slovenia, I don't want to sell the, the, the division. It's more about the process. But for uh, the society in Slovenia, uh, the biggest challenge, 
that really array was raised in each and every um, discussion workshop we had was a thrust or better mistrust. It's not just about trust in government or trust in institutions. It's about fundamental thrust in each other. So I think we are going back with, to what Ravi uh, said, and I really loved that uh, statement. So uh, that's the, the, one of the center points. And if you want to, ha to have the society moving in a different direction, we need to work on it. And it's one of the biggest question marks, and perhaps that's the question I would uh, also ask to, to, to you later on. But uh, if I conclude that, yes, the vision was um, a very challenging but very enlightening uh, exercise uh, after all. Uh, and of course, from vision and trying to be, um, of course, visions are not about dreaming, visions are not about being idealistic. At the end of the day, visions are about actions and this is where the tough part starts because making the vision alive and implement it uh, and make planning the words as a government of course the words that vision what people really want this is where the the, the, the tough starts the tough part really really starts so you, first of all you lose a lot of time then you have something you really believe in but then you have to make it happen. And this is what we are now doing it's as, a, as a second stage. It's the second stage is uh, the strategy of the country, which is much more shorter term, 2030. Also designed around the sustainable development goals that, are, that have the same date of when we need to implement them. And then tackle both vision and that together as, uh, let's say, responsible society prepare plans and we are now in the final stage of uh, preparing the, the strategy but again we already are discussing with the ministries also action plans and that's where the toughest part lies. So um, whenever you embark on this journey, um, well I have to admit it's not easy but I think that's the only way of how to make hope being realized from a government point of view. Uh, and in between, you know, and along the way, you're being laughed at, you're being, um, well, you are, um, you, know, you have to have um, a lot of patience to, to move on. And I think that because all horizontal issues are extremely uh, difficult to, in this silos world, to push through. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to be honest, uh, I don't want to sell that it's easy because it's not. Um, but what I would like to, to, to perhaps hear from you is first on trust, uh, what you think uh, any government should do, because I think this is a pretty general uh, problem in the society uh, globally. Uh, but on the other side, perhaps one of the big uh, challenges that we are facing is that, of course, if you have a vision and also strategy people-centered, it's still long-term. So how to make um, this long-term perspective, uh, how to meet the short-term requests from citizens that want the results today and now for their better lives already right now happen? That's one of the big question marks I have. Very, <laughs> oh, just, an, just a little off the cuff, uh, easy question. <laughs> Trust, that's certainly an issue in the United States. Any comments on that? Uh, maybe I'll just try to get a few minutes. Nobody wants to tackle that one. Like yeah, it's, you're it's, on your it's own. Not, <laughs> I'm on my own. <laughs> no, I think, thank you, Minister. I think it's uh, so heartening and uh, so such a welcome to hear a, a government minister raise such an issue. Uh, 
it's rare and compliments. Uh, I think we've done a little bit of research on trust and how it makes leadership effective. Would you mind standing up? Uh, how it makes the leadership effective in governments, in corporations, huh. in individuals. And I think uh, there are a few specific steps in each category, but there's one common thread in all, and that is transparency. Hmm. It's, I'm not talking of contrived transparency. I'm talking of genuine transparency, which basically means that we, we normally like to do our work like this, because I'm scared that if I open, what I have will fall. Mm -hmm. but I think if governments and corporations and individuals can work like this, you can keep what you have, but you do it with transparency. And this is what creates trust more than any other thing. Uh, what are the specific issues? Governments have the ability to make laws which help create an environment of trust in society by immediately <coughs> identifying those who are being untrustworthy and taking action against them. So punishing those who do not and they are with trust. Corporations, I think, are the key player. Adam Smith was right in those days that the hidden hand will correct the market anomalies. But corporations around the world have created a hidden fist which has totally decimated the hidden hand. So we have more and more monopolization taking place all over the world. In all key, but looking at the data centers, for example, the five big people will control 90% of the global data. And they'll determine whether I play their tune or not. They can, for example, make, debar me from using Google if I go against them. So they can ostracize me. OK, this man is not allowed to. So I think corporations need to stop using that fist. And individuals, I think, have to believe that, as Michelangelo said, that the greater danger is not that we aim too low and achieve it, but we must aim higher. doesn't matter if it, we miss it. So I think that's where the situation lies. But across all three categories, the greatest obstacles to having realistic hope and achieving realistic hope lie not outside, but within. Mm -hmm. Within the country, within the organization, within the individual. Well, I see we have a fourth member of the panel here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're really contributing. And I know there are other comments and perspectives out there too on trust and what Alinka is trying to do. Oh yes, sorry, didn't see you. Hi. Hi. Is this working? Yeah. All yes. Right. And could you identify yourself? Katya Gershak. I'm the editor of Blessed Strategic Times. The first thing I have to say is that we didn't do justice to this topic in the, this year's uh, um, edition, and I hope we'll do better next year. Um, these are all very fascinating topics. Uh, I don't really know where to pick up, but. One of the maybe perhaps questions to raise um, to Mrs. Mercola when you were talking about how to create uh, better trust within society and how to uh, perhaps uh, reduce um, and produce results faster or, or make people more willing to wait for them. And I have to keep coming back to the one point that I emphasized also yesterday. One is emotional maturity. We don't talk about enough about human intelligence on the emotional level. And I think it goes back to what Ravi says as well, what we do within ourselves. So not to elaborate on that because I think I'm repeating myself already. And the second thing is education. Uh, I would really be interested to know in your plan how much you've looked at education. Our school systems here are very rigid. They are still very much top down. Um, memorization, and we all talk about how this is all outdated, how we need to give our young generation the ability to analyze information rather than to teach it. And I, I know I have you know, one in kindergarten now and, and, and a stepson in school, and, and I see, I do homework with him, and 
and it's still very much, it's so rigid. He has to memorize all these textbooks. And I wonder, when are we going to make this change? Because at the end of the day, if we want realistic hope, if we want a better future, well, this is where we have to start. Why is it so difficult to reform or at least make some general steps in this direction in our school systems? We've been talking about this for 20 years. We've said exactly the same thing in our country. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. ah, well, um, First of all, in the, in the vision itself, one of the five big, I would say, values um, was what, what, what really came out was learning for and through life. So from the kindergarten, from being a, a child to basically the, the moment you die. And it's not about just formal education, it's about everything. And of course, if you look at the formal part of the education, what we really need to do is try and bring some values back and make education more uh, closer to kids. And um, that's also the reason why we, um, while we were pushing very hard and succeeded at the end, um, I am very proud of it. It's, um, we will have a pilot project in uh, the uh, in the schools yeah. in the primary schools fifth grade where the elements of the vision will be discussed so uh, we had it starts this year uh, and we had last week uh, I think roughly 20, 200 teachers participating and trying to understand and try they will have a pilot and they will really try to do it things differently and they will play with these kids that are completely able to absorb everything. And a lot of it is also about emotional intelligence that you are speaking about. So I hope this, not I hope, I know this project is going to succeed because already the feedbacks that we have, I don't know, my, my, my <laughs> it's, it goes <laughs> like uh, the feedbacks that we have, the teachers that participated brought, nobody forced them to do it was just incredible. So um, I really, uh, perhaps Tim, you were there. Um, I would use you uh, to, to perhaps share a little bit of the feeling there because I was not able to be there. And to just say a few more words because Tim is also uh, a co-author of the, the, let's say, uh, the book that we prepared for the teachers, and yes, this is what we need to do. Uh, it's the first small step. You cannot reform an educational system overnight, but it has to be, it has to start somewhere, and it has to start with kids, because they are the future we want, and this is the future we live, basically also for them, and for their kids then afterwards. Tim, perhaps just a, a few words. I really want to use you. Uh, and tell a few tell a few words about it. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the word. Um, just shortly, uh, maybe I'll describe not the the form, but the the content of what kind of seminar we prepared for uh, the teachers. Uh, so we were trying to what we were trying to do is figure out how we can offer the teachers the tools to work with the children in a different, uh, more innovative and, um, let's say, uh, in a way that the kids themselves participate in the learning process. So they, they shape the process and not just receive or be at the receiving end of the learning curve, but uh, co-create the values, the content, and um, so we prepared a kind of a toolkit for, for the teachers uh, to use in the classrooms. And uh, like the minister said, the responses were amazing. They were, um, first of all, they were, uh, they didn't know what to expect. So uh, when they first came, because it was all done on a, um, let's say, uh, yeah, active participation, and um, they didn't know what to expect, but at the end, the results were uh, were pretty amazing. They were um, 
not only grateful for the for the toolkit, but for the opportunity to co-create an environment where uh, kids can uh, learn to uh, not only shape the future, but co-create uh, the values that we as a society need for the future. So, um, yeah, that's just shortly. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things we've discovered in working on this project, this book, is that often it seems that the despair comes from a kind of global overview, but hope comes from the bottom in these experiments that come up and then propagate, that there's something about these grassroots efforts that, um, that offer instances of realistic hope. And it, then it's a matter of scaling them. There's a comment here. Oh, Philippe. Well, you haven't spoken, Philippe, so I'm calling on you. Good morning. Uh, could you stand and introduce yourself? Is the mic working? OK. Yeah. Uh, Philippe van den Broek from Belgium. Uh, Minister, you asked the question about how to connect this long-term vision to contemporary expectations of Slovenian citizens. And I think the question is very difficult to answer, partly because we are transitioning in our worldview from a mechanistic understanding of change to an understanding which is much more holistic or systemic. Um, Rebecca Zolnit, a well-known activist writer, wrote a book a few years ago, Hope in the Dark. And there she said, we believe... Our belief in cause and effect leads us to see history as a, as a march. But history is not an army. It's actually a crap scuttling sideways. And I think it's a very appropriate image to, 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 to express that change happened in, in, in unpredictable ways. And in your short introduction, you used two words which almost exemplify this tension between the two worldviews, the mechanistic and the holistic. You talked about navigating stormy waters, and you also used the word plan. And, and these two words sit very uneasily with each other. And so I think when we talk in terms, or we think in terms of tools or methodologies, I think one of the key tools that we need is a new way, an alternative way to assess where we are in these complex change processes. So we need new ways to assess impact, to evaluate relative success. And so today we see the very beginnings, I think, of these alternative approaches. We talk about developmental evaluation, we talk about complex sensitive evaluation or reflexive monitoring in action. And I think that's also, from my point of view, is a source of hope. Hope that financing institutions and people with resources will be able to take these more holistic ways of assessing where we are in a very complex change process on board. So. Can I build on yes, that? Yes, yes. Let me build on that. Thanks, Philippe. Um, so I was asked to talk about principles. As we're still writing a book, they are emerging. So I'm, I can't share them all, but I'm going to try and touch upon some of them. Is that okay? <laughs> and I have to excuse everybody else on the panel because they might not agree even with the principles I'm presenting. <laughs> They're that hot off the press. <laughs> but let me start with, I, I'm very interested, Philippe, you introduced an activist and that activist, she also made another comment. She said, realistic hope is not a lottery ticket that you sit clutching on a sofa. It's an ax that you use to break down the door. And we've both had, we've had examples in the panel of the axes. There are new axes. There are new tools. And of why you can't sit on the sofa. And I just want to bear that, you know, those are really important. And I want to talk about one of the principles that's emerging from the book, which for many of us is so self-evident. We sometimes ask ourselves, what, why? Is this really a principle? Is it really a principle? Is it not so self-evident that everybody understands this? And this is the principle. The principle is that we are learning our way into the future. We are learning our way into the future. We are learners. When we talk about the education system, we tend to mean the 0 to 5 to 10 to 15 year olds as the learners. No, we are learning our way into the future. Betty Sue opened this, you ended this by saying that the future is this story that we need to have realistic hope, and it's really about the now, right? 
The, the story of the future is what helps us understand where we stand in the present. It's part of that, understanding the complexity. So here's my proposition. The future is a teddy bear for us, for us smart, bright, capable people. It's a teddy bear because a teddy bear for a child is a transitional object. It gives the child courage. It allows the child to explore. It allows the child to do remarkable things, to let go of safety and move forward. And we, we're either eternal optimists or we're cynical pessimists by the time we get into adulthood, right? And we've got to let go of optimism and pessimism as the way to guide ourselves to the future. And we've got to become learners. And in this learning journey, we are focusing on looking for something. And that something that we're looking for is where is the transformational intervention point that we can actually collectively work on that actually allows a real pop-up of flourishing, not this, that's the crab walking sideways. And it's not discovered in one source of, one space of expertise or in one organization. It's discovered in these spaces between, in this connective tissue that we've lost. And so that, one of the principles that we will promote from the book is that the, we are learning our way into the future. And that requires a stance of humility as well as a stance of courage. And it requires us all to find a teddy bear and to create those interventional points. So that, that was, that's my reflection on a first principle. Do you want me to keep going? Part of that principle is that um, one of the things we observe, I, I go to a lot of these meetings and I love them. I'm like an excited atom. I sit there listening to all these panel discussions. They're lined up with all these very impressive people. And I think to myself, yes, I'm going to hear something. And then the panel talks and talks and talks and talks. And I go, oh, <laughs> hmm. And I wonder what it is that's missing, right? And what we're trying to do to here today is have a conversation with you. And why are we trying to have a conversation? It's because conversation is actually what you need to make learning contagious. So we're all learners, but actually we're not waiting for received wisdom. We all have wisdom. We don't know how to bring it out, so we need to have a conversation. So the part of learning our way into the future is about creating these spaces for more and better conversations. And look around you. We have lots of discussion. We have lots of reporting but we don't really have good spaces for conversation. <laughs> Comments? Questions? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, in the government, oh, to have a, a proper and a timely space for conversation is a very difficult thing. Sometimes, I imagine, I mean, we have a lot of conversations, but mainly everything is prepared. And I think also these conversations uh, that we uh, usually have in balance are prepared because you basically have to say what is prepared. So today is a little bit awkward. But I can, I would really like to imagine myself a platform where we could discuss everybody, you know, uh, government with business, uh, business with business, uh, people to people, where ideas could just have a sort of a, you know, a <laughs> yeah. flying, emerge, I don't know, where, where ideas and where, where we could actively listen, perhaps, or be able to talk with no, well, from your heart, from within, as Ravi said at the beginning. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting topic that you raised, and uh, I didn't know you were, you, you were going to speak about such a principle. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I think that we all lack um, communication and active listening at the end of the day. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I, I will shut that. It's worth, I mean, I know that we talk about discussion and conversation as though they're the same things. And I wonder if it's worth just remembering what the difference is, right? So discussion 
has its root in linguistic terms in percussion and the beating of a drum. Things go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. We discuss lots of... Here's the report. Let's have a discussion. So we talk at each other, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. At the end, we all feel we've had a good discussion and absolutely nothing has happened. Nothing has changed. But in a conversation, a conversation is turning things over together. And you can't get to action, new, this space of actions without these conversations. And it seems, you know, I, I know somebody's going to tell me you can't have a conversation with everybody. Maybe not. But you can have more conversation than you're having. You can find and create spaces for some of these conversations. And in a way, if you can find them in a way where we don't rely... I, I'm a mother of kids, but let's not wait for the education system to be reformed. We haven't got that much time. We have to educate ourselves in this new reality by becoming learners and having conversations across all our levels of brilliance and expertise and find these new intervention points. And that puts us all as peers, right? It's not that here's the great panel sitting up here. Every one of us in every life listens to so many different voices from so many different perspectives because it's between those voices that we identify that space. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. I was thinking about uh, the principles and then thinking about how to transform a vision into a plan also from a government perspective. If I'm from Minister of Foreign Affairs. But, and I was thinking, okay, our vision, because we've been working also on the 2030 agenda and so on, and uh, it's, it, it becomes a bureaucratic exercise more than anything else. But at the end, if, you l if we just, if I take our constitution, I see the vision in the constitution is fine, still holds perfectly. Now the point is how you transform this into actually a plan. And one principle that has been for us very important in the past but has been challenged today is the ability to compromise. Between the two, between the vision and the plan, you have compromise. If you don't have compromise, forget about it. You plan will be, vision and plan will be wiped out. Next government, maybe it's the same I'm sorry if I'm so blunt, the <laughs> minister, but, <laughs> but you were saying it's a conversation. And, uh, and this is the point, is how you, this capacity, personal capacity to compromise, to say, accept, I'm not the depository of the truth, but there is bits and pieces that needs to be discussed there. The way we did in the past, we institutionalized processes to get to this compromise. This is what we call subsidiarity principle. This is the reason why we have such a, um, uh, let's say, direct democracy and so on and so on. But as to be frank, this worked very well till 10, 15 years ago. Now everything goes too fast. Because in order to compromise, you need to have a little bit of a perception on first on what, what we are talking about, how the m targets are moving and how where does bits and pieces and truths are? And these days it's not that easy to define this. And this is the same for governments, for corporate institutions. We speak a lot with corporate institutions, big companies, but also with simple citizens. I talk with my, regularly with my, simply in my village, I'm coming from a 200 to 500 people village, and then, and then even there for compromises, small things, it takes a long time. It is a long discussion. And there is recently less attitude towards sharing. And so the mechanism, institutional mechanism we set up for the compromise are not functioning well, very well anymore. So the question is, are you talking about this in the book? I mean, you don't read the book, of course. And is this something that we maybe would be nice to have a conversation in the future? Because if you know we're going to drown all of us, if we are not capable to compromise in the future. Yeah. I appreciate, the, I appreciate the point, but I would like maybe just to introduce another language. Because when we talk about compromise, from my point of view, it's loaded with some suggestions of being a static, a win-lose situation to a certain extent. Somebody wins, somebody gains. 
I would like to refer to the work of Peter Checkland who developed soft systems methodology. He doesn't talk about compromise, but about accommodation. And I think that's an interesting word because the thing is, it, it avoids, from my point of view, a little bit this win-lose situation. And on the other hand, it ties into what Angela said earlier. It ties into our disposition to act because the accommodation is about a temporary agreement that we are jointly able to take the next step towards action, towards improvement of the very complicated situation where we are dealing with. So again, in terms of tools and methodologies, I think language is a very important uh, tool. And so changing the discourse, even in, mi in minor ways, from away from compromise to accommodation could be a meaningful contribution. I wanted to pick up a different point. I think that's a great one. And does the book address it, Betty Sue? Well, yes, we do have a chapter, because there's a chapter by Verena and, and Martin who are looking at what does, what does politics mean in this space and what, what, where's it going to? So I, I, won't, um, I can only give you a teaser on that. But I want to talk about what I think is the wrong compromise that I hear a lot. And that is this, um, this trilemma compromise of, sus of sustainability. I hear a lot, you know, I've, I've watched some of the, 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 the feed of the questions and you know, I'm, you, I can feel some frustration in some of the audiences that, oh, now we're talking about security, what happened to sustainability? And now we're talking about globalization, what happened to the environment? And now we're talking about, and we've, we've, we've lived with this, this, this three pillared concept since, you know, 1960 probably, but it became politically popular with the Brundtland Commission in the 1980s. And this is the concept that we've got to have this balance of economy and society and environment. And it's, it's a terrible, <coughs> the language of balance is terrible. What we need is a transformation of the relationships between them. Because the balance is a, cons is a conservatism which is going to lock out so many people. We've got to sort of like explode it somehow. So it's, it, I'm interested in this compromise as accommodation in politics and in, in our concept of the, one of the other principles that we have is we have to stop talking about tri trilemma and we have to start talking about transformation of the value creation system because we're not looking for trade-offs we're looking for new possibilities of value co-creation. In the back there? Yes. yes. Hello. Yes. <laughs> I'm Jira Kalkogobo from Focus Association for Sustainable Development, coming from the non-governmental sector. And actually, I'm going to pick up here. You were talking about having to be learners. I think we are very bad learners because we are hooked up on some... Um, ideological dogmas, let's call them that way, and we are not ready to rethink them or maybe think outside of these kind of uh, boxes. This is be it, um, the classical is uh, the need for economic growth no matter what. I mean, if we are going to talk about different kinds of development in the future, if we, we have to ask questions also about the dogmas of our current system, and I think this is one of those dogmas which are not thought about enough. I mean, there are talks and scientific discussions from the 60s, 70s. There are books being written. Scientific community is more or less agreeing on what's needed to do because of climate change and other problems. But in the political sphere, we are still hooked on some terms which we just don't want, don't want to discuss about them. So maybe we just have to be better learners and open ourselves also to some more um, really transformational um, thoughts and futures and ideas we do want to, which will produce some real change, not just uh, like a different color of the same reality. So maybe just a comment, thank you. One, one thought that this conversation sparked for me and the principle of, uh, of learning ourselves into the future is this question um, also raised by, by one of the uh, commentators in, in the back of planning versus iteratively entering into the future. 
And uh, I have never worked in government. I've worked in the private sector and now in the, in the nonprofit space. But when I think about government, then I would classify government more as a planning entity. And I think the, the other two sectors are more you know, using agile methods and, and kind of iterative, uh, iterative learning more and more. And so I feel the gap seems to be widening between those sectors in terms of how quickly can we can we adapt? Uh, how perfect does the solution need to be? Um, and, and it feels to me that that is a critical capacity that we need more and more of. And, um, and I see that as a big challenge for government because I also recognize the risks that need to be mitigated uh, and the environment that governments are operating on. But if we can't come to um, more quickly thinking about how can we experiment and learn how will we really deal with our challenges? And uh, one point that I wasn't able to make earlier in my introduction when I think about, for example, data, big data, um, um, and uh, um, how quickly that space is going to change over the next 10 years. And what does that mean for regulatory and, and the legal environment, for example, where we need to protect uh, kind of ethical values and data ownership and privacy, but at the same time also want to create the space for to use these new tools for the social good and for the benefit of people. So those are just some questions uh, that I <laughs> that I don't have real answers to, but that I want to throw into the mix. So I, I think that's fascinating because, again, another theme at this um, at, throughout the forum that I've been hearing is innovation, innovation, mm -hmm. innovation. And, and I love innovation, but we, we, it also requires a little bit of care because, you know, innovation can be in the interests of the elite. It can be about value capture. It's not without, you can't manage innovation so it's just perfectly good. You know, it brings, technology is neither good, it's not bad, and it's not neutral, right? We know this stuff. But I wonder, we, you know, I've been watching, I, we're here at a, I know we're at a conference that's, that's um, really started off in its origins in security. We have lots of ministers of foreign affairs and all this stuff. And I've been fascinated that we've had this concept of diplomacy and people have been talking about we need a new form of diplomacy. And we've, you know, we've, we've stopped marrying off king's daughters as diplomatic relations. <laughs> We sort of entered into the United Nations era and we had a form of state-centric diplomacy. And then we sort of came through a period of economic diplomacy. And then we've sort of, I understand, we've just left the room. We now have water diplomacy. And I think we probably are entering an era of design diplomacy. And that's where innovation is not, you know, when I was at the OECD, I, one of the diplomats said to me, you don't understand diplomacy. He says, in diplomacy, our job is to push all the problems into the future. I said, you've been very <laughs> successful, sir. <laughs> right? And so design diplomacy is the reverse of that. It's not pushing our problems into the future. It's pulling the future into the present, but in a way where the innovation isn't about the current winners. It's about creating the space for the people who aren't within the system already. Marianne, again, I think that all the points that you about the space and creating new, I think that that really leads back to the trust and transparency. And I think that's kind of loop because I think that you cannot have meaningful conversation which would leave you f lead you further without really having trust that you are safe there and that something that your word is respected in a way. Thank you, Angela. I think you have raised, uh, I think, the most significant uh, point, conversation. Uh, the quality of conversation in a family, in an organization, in a government, determines the quality of growth, the quality of innovation, and the quality of governance. This is basically a very important point. In fact, uh, uh, I was listening to His Holiness Dalai Lama once, and then he came to an important point in his discourse, and he said, now, 
I want you to listen to me with your eyes. What he was saying is that you can only listen properly when you are listening with your eyes. Otherwise, ears, you are gone. I mean, you're always doing something else. That is the wholesome listening. That's the real awareness, mindfulness, which creates the whole person. And I think when you listen to someone with your eyes, you kindle hope in that person. And that's what the subject is, basically. So thank you for raising this issue. And I also like what you said about uh, the future is about learning. Milan Kundera put, puts it very nicely to so support your theme that life is really uh, going on stage unrehearsed. You live only one life. And you have to live it. There, there's no script. There's no prompter. You have to do your best. That comes from confidence. Confidence comes from the quality of conversation you have with the people you meet. Thank you. The quality of conversation could be helped even by d changing the architecture in which we hold diplomatic conversations. I'm, I'm always flummoxed when I walk into a room and there's these fixed, the fixed architecture where you would sit and not move around. There are places for you to put your papers that you read at each other. What a waste of time. What if you just gave up all that and just had people talking and someone coming around to say, okay, I hear, this is what I heard and try again and try again, an iterative process. Nobody in any entrepreneurial space I know of where things are being invented has fixed architectural places to read at each other. I, that must come back from courtly dances when we did diplomacy in courts. It, it comes back from doing the, having to know the minuet and to wear your stockings the right way uh, and to say the right thing and to have the right you know, silverware in the right place. I don't know. It seems to me even at the level of changing the architecture, we could do a lot better than we do. Um, maybe there's a good reason to have these fixed architectural discussion spaces, but I, I, can't, I can't think of any. The best board I was a member of, a very contentious board, there were a lot of difficult issues, but we had a, a kind of Tibetan bowl in the middle of the boardroom, and anybody at any time could, could hit the bowl, and it would make that familiar sound, and at that point, we all had to stop talking for one minute. It didn't matter what was going in the middle of the content. The bowl was hit. Silence for a minute. It really changed. The and we were looking at each other. And some of us would start laughing because the things that we were arguing about so much in the silence seemed a little laughable. <laughs> you know, um, there are different architect different design elements that we could imagine. We're very imaginative, we human beings. Why can't we imagine different ways? to hold meetings, different ways to design the space in which to speak. That's, that's not rocket science. Um, anyway, down from my screed place. Um, I would like to hear what our distinguished commentator has to say so far. He's patiently sat through all the <laughs> panel and through your comments, and um, he's been listening and some of us have been talking, and he's been listening. So, um, Hello. I think it's on. It's been fascinating listening to each and every one, the panelists and the, some of those that responded. Uh, and in this context, I would like to start off by making a small observation on what we said about poverty uh, and, the and the possible elimination of poverty in the future. Uh, I do not quite agree that it is that the poor should have more rights. I think we struggle in, a, in, a, in an era where rights are quite unequal between, even between countries. The women's rights that exist in one part of Europe doesn't exist in Saudi Arabia, for example. Gay rights that might be acceptable in Europe and the United States is not accepted in some parts of Africa and some parts of Asia too. So it is I think not a question of rights, but I think uh, what Ravi possibly meant, uh, and I would agree 100% if that is what he meant, is that the opportunities to the poor must be much more. For instance, in today's structure, uh, a person who has some financial uh, strength is able on the strength of his financial soundness 
to go to a financial institution, show his assets, and borrow money, perhaps get a loan. Uh, he's due to the fact that he's financially financially secure, uh, get the uh, required technology because today lots of financiers and the financial world is connected to technology as well. So technological development helps you make more money sometimes, helps you advance in the field of uh, money making perhaps. And without technology sometimes you can't do that. Now what a poorer person does not have the access to is technology. They do not have the uh, opportunity to go out and get a loan like a person who had finances do. The, the existing structure allows the rich man to get richer, as I think Ravi rightly said. Uh, it does not allow the poor man to come out of poverty. But what we must also escape from and not get into is that situation of feeding the poor people continuously with money. That is not the answer. That is continuous uh, uh, milk or whatever being poured into a black hole. It just goes nowhere. You have to give them the opportunity to stand on their own two feet. You don't place a piece of fish on their plate. You give them a net and a fishing boat and allow them the ability to catch their own fish and uh, able to sustain their own economy, basically. Uh, give them a means to establish a livelihood. That is what is important, not give the poorest people money because they become dependents like drug users. They just be, they'll just get used to the drug of getting money as a free handout. That is not really the solution, I think. Uh, so we have to look at it in a way where they actually establish a new livelihood, I think, for themselves. But how do you do that? That is the question because in Europe it might be easy to identify the poorest people in Europe. And the governments in Europe might be able to help them financially to get out of their poverty or being poor, if, if not poverty. But how does India do it? How does countries in Africa do it when they have a huge population that is uh, struggling in poverty? Uh, and they probably don't have the technology to give them. They don't have the finances to uh, strengthen them. So we have to look at this as an international problem, not as an African problem, not as a problem that affects one part of the world. Similarly, I think somebody just spoke about climate change or mentioned something to do with climate change. And in that context, I would just like to say, uh, I would like to just bring a Sri Lankan scenario into context because I come from Sri Lanka. We are a little island in case anyone doesn't know where we are. Uh, this, uh, the southernmost tip of India, you're a tiny little island, a little dot in, in the uh, ocean, in the Indian Ocean. However, our country is a country that has sunshine almost 365 days of the year. And we don't have a winter. We have sunshine almost every day. But one third of our energy is got from burning fossils and fossil fuels. Now, the reason I bring that up is we are talking about environmental pollution. And Sri Lanka is a country that can possibly manage entirely on uh, solar power because we have sunshine every day of the year, almost. Uh, but why can't we do that? Because we don't have the adequate resources to do it. The country, because it's a in huge investment initially to go for entirely solar power or something like that. One third of our country depends on hydropower, which is not bad, which is renewable and it's okay. But one third is by burning fossils, uh, which is imported to Sri Lanka and burnt. So we, we pay for the fossils to come in, we burn it and we pollute the environment. Now, environmental pollution and global pollution, though we talk of climate change globally, we look at it either as countries or regionally. Now it doesn't matter if India, if India or Indonesia pollutes X number of times, it's not that India's or Indonesia's pollution doesn't uh, affect only India or Indonesia or China or America. It affects Slovenia, it affects Sri Lanka, it affects every other country. We live in one, we live in one planet. So whether it is uh, Indonesia's pollution or America's pollution, it is our pollution. It is a common problem we all have. So why can't the world look at the belt which is close to the equator 
help all those countries near the equator to develop uh, solar power in their countries, and there'll be no fossils burnt in those countries. Doesn't that help positively to the international problem of global pollution? It does. So why don't we look at it as an international problem instead of a... We talk of global pollution, but we don't look at it. We don't act as if it is a global problem. We act as if it's a regional or national problem. It is not. We, all, we live in one island. All of us live on one island. And that island is planet Earth. Thank you. Yes, yes. I think that's the whole point of realistic hope, is that we actually all live in the exhaust trails of everybody else, all of us. And one of the biggest, you know, one of the things that drives me absolutely mad when I listen to lots of debates about development is, you know, some countries need to catch up with other countries. The, the world of catch up went a long time ago. We're not catching up anymore. We're co-producing. And realistic hope isn't this is what you do with people over here and it's what you do with an issue over here. It's this connectivity of these different spaces. But if we just try and connect all the dots, trying to work out everything that's connected to everything, we'll become absolutely exhausted, right? We'll build a map, a glorious map, which is so comprehensive it'll be useless. And that's why I like what Claudia was saying before. We have a lot more capability of bringing a lot more big data to bear, but we have to bring it to bear in a space where that space is about making action change. And that change has to be in the benefits of not the, you know, today there are 500 million people in Europe, 700 million people in Africa. In 2030, there'll be 500 million people in Europe, and there'll be 2 billion in Africa. And when you look where this, the, the inclusion has to come from, it's from these other spaces, and they're very different. With, you know, if, you want, if you want to I have a conversation with you with my other hat on, we're from the World Energy Council. It's not a technology substitution issue. It's a, value, a system value creation issue. You can't just take technologies and substitute them around the world. You've got to create whole ecosystems, social, political, economic, and technological together. That's the art. That's, if you want to get... Solar isn't a cost issue. It's also a capability issue. It's also an economy issue. And it's not just about... If we don't just want to put feed milk down, then we have to build hope up. And how do we create for Sri Lanka, for your, for your area, not just the possibility to import solar technology, but a whole economy and society that can use solar in, together with other endowed resources to create a different form of economy, polity and society. He was uh, reiterating the point that it's not something that can be done nationally. Let me ask if there are any comments now. We've had three different perspectives on realistic hope. We've had tools, we've had a perspective, we've had the exploration of a principle. Um, any comments from anyone? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Jana. I come from Slovenian NGO Caritas. Um, and um, Mr. from Sri Lanka inspired me what he said that we have to uh, teach the people uh, to catch the fish, not to give them fish. Uh, I would just like maybe present um, one our project with I think that it is realistic hope for the future because I think that the biggest hope is that we give the work to the poor people, to the parents. We have very nice project. Um, in Africa, in some African countries, in Albania and in Sri Lanka. Um, and it is solidarity among Slovenian uh, families. We live in developed world. So to the poorest families in the world. So uh, through the monthly donation, uh, people in those countries, the poorest one get a job and payment. And this give to everyone dignity in Slovenia, in other European countries, worldwide. And now with their earnings in Africa, for example, this is one euro per day. This is nothing from our point of view, but they can survive. Uh, they have for the food, the children can go to school, they, gave to the, they have to the health. So, and 
I, I meet this. I go, like the minister said, we have to go to the field among people. And all these initiatives uh, come out from the people, from the African people. So, uh, and I met with the families wi which are now independent because they have work um, and so on. And then now, after three years in to be included in the program, they have their own house, their own land. They start with some small businesses and they can live uh, on themselves and uh, they have really dignity. They are proud and they have hope. Before, there was no hope in the countries uh, where climate change affects a lot, conflicts affect them, but this, these are small steps. This is not in the governmental level, but it is also in a local level, but I think that these small steps, because we can't wait that the world politics will change. We have to do what we can, every, each of us today, person to person, so we can start. And um, I think that uh, also some, nice programs in such ways can be do as well on the government level but yeah i was really inspired inspired by uh, mr from sri lanka and there we have for example we uh, mention credits in sri lanka we have a uh, microfinancing so the family get the funds uh, to uh, develop some small family business uh, so they do with uh, Carita sri lanka staff uh, business plan uh, so and they really follow and Last year, nine families um, with this business um, uh, start to um, develop on their own so they can buy new thing, develop, for example, like poultry or uh, farming or sewing and so on. So I think this is, this is the hope for the future that everyone can have a job and to have a decent life to the family to have the resources. And I also have one question for you, uh, Mrs. Claudia. Um, you mentioned business sector uh, also and cooperation. Um, there is a lot of funds, we know. <laughs> and how you see maybe, if I understand you well, the cooperation among big business and now non-governmental sector, especially in the, the most uh, poor countries in the world, that we could do something um, for the common good. Thank you. Maybe Maybe a quick answer. Um, some of the work that um, I, I did while I was uh, still with the Rockefeller Foundation, which I left only last Friday, um, was around agricultural value chains. Um, and um, I mean, I like collaboration with the private sector best when it really feels like it's embedded, for example, in their real business. So it's not kind of the appendices of uh, um, um, corporate social responsibility, but it's really uh, part of um, the, the kind of how the company operates. Um, and I think a lot of, for example, the food companies have made significant efforts and I think have had successes in terms of thinking about how to set up their supply chains uh, to work with smallholder farmers in, in Africa. Um, and. Uh, I think that creates an economic opportunity, to your point, uh, uh, Minister, earlier, um, f an economic opportunity for the smallholder farmers, but also allows, for example, the companies to uh, diversify uh, their supply chains and their sourcing um, streams. So um, th that's one example that, that I think is headed in the right direction. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope you go away with uh, more hope and that it's realistic enough that you can take action from it um, and come to the next panel, which will be here as a fishbowl, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.